Hello and welcome to this Functional Skills Training Webinar. My name is Chris Briggs and I am the Product Manager for Post-16 English, Maths and Digital Skills here at Pearson. And today we're looking at problem solving in Level 1 and Level 2 Functional Skills Maths. Our overview for this session. So we'll start by having a look at the issues that the learners are facing and then move on to making sure the learners understand the question and finish by looking at some problem solving teaching techniques. So let's have a look at the issues. Now, according to our examiners, there are a number of key issues that the learners face when they're accessing the assessments um, at level one, level two. First of all, they're not fully prepared for the full content of their level, especially at level two. And so learners are going into the assessment, not being taught everything that may come up on the exam, and they're finding it difficult then to engage with some of the topics. Obviously, in a perfect world, the learners would be able to do everything they need to be able to do on these assessments. The next one, the learners are not showing they're working out clearly or at all. And this is a problem. Learners um, will get process marks at, at times throughout the assessment. So they do need to ensure that their working out is as clear as can be. Especially when you look at the next one where learners are not carrying out checks of their work. Um, Learners will be facing specific questions on checks of their work, and they do need to be able to check that their work is correct. Obviously, in order to get this mark, they do need to have shown their previous working as well. If they're asked to do a reverse calculation and they haven't shown any prior calculations, then they're not going to be able to access those marks. The next one, the learners are not answering the question on decision-making questions. And we have an example here. And the question that the learners is asked is, is £1,200 enough to buy the 14 chairs? Obviously, this is a yes or no question, and the learners do need to engage and say yes or no when they give their answer. Finally, the learners are not understanding what is being asked of them. So they're looking at the questions at times and thinking, I don't know what I need to do here. I don't know what I'm being asked to do. Now, as well as working with the examiners, we also reached out to practitioners as well. And I hosted an event called hashtag UKFE chat on Twitter. And here are some of the comments that came in from practitioners about the issues that learners face at level one and level two. First of all, we've got the student's memory. They can follow and use the methods confidently in class, but they can't recall them in the exam. Then we have general mass anxiety, and mass anxiety is quite high uh, across the country. And finally, we have, I think it's a myriad of issues. There's more content covered at these levels with the new specification. The questions are quite wordy, and there's a higher percentage of problem solving questions in comparison to GCSE. So let's move on and start to look at understanding the question. Now, as was said by the practitioners, the questions are more wordy than GCSE, but literacy should not be an issue for the learners. The language is set at a level lower than the maths, so they shouldn't be coming into a level two maths exam and facing level two literacy, they'll be facing level one literacy in there. We also have an English specialist on board to ensure that difficult vocabulary is avoided wherever possible as well. The content is designed, I'm sorry, the context is designed to be accessible to the majority of the learners. So they should be context that the learners are aware of from everyday life or work. And the learners do have access or can have access to a dictionary and or a bilingual dictionary in the assessment if they feel they need it. Now, the key issue seems to be that the learners are not successfully approaching the problem solving elements of the assessment rather than the literacy. They do not understand the question, not because of the words, but because of the maths that's involved. So in order to try and address this, let's look at some problem solving teaching techniques that can be used in the classroom. Before we go into the techniques, let's just have a look at how the assessments are set out. In the reform functional skills, problem solving skills and underpinning skills have been separated. 
Now, the underpinning skills questions may be in a context where they are more structured, more scaffolded than the problem solving questions. They assess the learner's knowledge and understanding rather than their ability to apply this knowledge and understanding. And the underpinning skills form 25% of the marks across the paper. What this means is the problem solving is 75%, which is significantly higher than on the GCSE assessments. So this is a level two underpinning skills question. You can notice there's no context here. It's just a straightforward question on surface area. And the learners are even told it's a surface area question. So you look at it, they're given a cube, they're given the sides of the cubes, and they're told work out the surface area of the cube. All they need to do here is basically have the knowledge of how to work out surface area. If they have that knowledge, then they can work this out and they'll get the three marks. What we have here is a problem solving question, which is a variation on the underpinning question I just thought, showed you. First of all, notice there's a lot more marks involved in this question. Six mark question here. And also, it's not just looking at the learner's knowledge of surface area. Other skills are involved here too. So not only do they need to work out the surface area, they also need to work out how much paint they would use so they're working with money as well. Finally, the learners are not told this in this question that they need to work out the surface area. So understanding this is part of the problem solving aspect of the question. So let's have a look at some exemplar learner responses. And these are actual responses from learners taking our assessments in a live uh, format. So here we have the question that I actually showed you at the beginning. Um, and the learner has achieved one mark out of the possible four here for this. Now, the issue with this does not seem to be problem solving based as a learner knows what to do, but doesn't execute it correctly. So you can actually see they've worked out the cost of 14 chairs. They've then attempted to work out the cost of the VAT of the 14 chairs. And it's that working of how the percentage, working out the 20% is what they've got wrong. So they've understood what the problem is. They've just not executed it correctly. What I just want you to know as well, they don't actually answer the question either. So they actually give a value, but they don't say yes or no, whether or not it's enough. Here's another question from level one. And here the learner has achieved two marks out of the four. And the issue here is problem solving based. Well, that's how I feel. The learner only does half of what is necessary to find the answer. So in this question, um, they need to find what type of car is better value. What they've done is they've found the value of the running costs. So they've compared the running costs, but they haven't then factored in the cost of buying the car as well. Again, they've not fully answered the question. Okay, the, which type of car is better value? Show why you think this. So they put diesel car. They haven't put in there because the price of the running cost compared and the, the, the actual cost of the car is less than that of the petrol car as well. So they need to be putting that in as well. Okay, so exemplar three is a, a level one question. And here again, the learner has achieved just one mark out of three. Now, this is not a problem solving issue, I think. Um, and what we've got here is a typical problem that happens at level one and level two. And with this, learners find it difficult to differentiate between area, perimeter, volume, and surface area at level two. So what we've got is the learners started to show they understand what is being asked of them because it's a perimeter question. It says perimeter in the question as well. And they started to work out some of the uh, smaller 
uh, sides that are not given in the question. However, once they've done that, they've then just given up and worked out the area instead. So again, it is important that they're taught the difference between the perimeter and area and volume, but they're also taught how to differentiate the questions as well to make sure they're understanding which of these questions is which. Here we have a, another level one question. And here the learner has achieved two marks out of the five. And again, we're saying this is a problem solving based question because the learner starts well, looks like they're sort of answering the question and then just stops and gives the volume. So in this question, they have to work out the volume uh, when the tank is two thirds full and then what that is in liters. So they work out the actual volume. They've divided it by three. So they're showing they know what they're doing. What they haven't then done is work out what two thirds is and then divided it by a thousand to get the cubic centimeters into liters. So in this sort of situation, they know what they're doing. They're just not fully accessed. It's the problem solving that is the issue here. They haven't solved the problem. And finally, we've got one here from level two, and the learner has achieved two marks out of the five here. And again, the issue seems to be one of problem solving. And again, the learner starts well, then stops and gives a partial answer. So in this question, they need to work out how much wire they would need to make an earring, and then how many earrings they could make from three rolls of wire. because. Uh, Mario, who's doing this, is supposed to be making eight earrings. Now, they've worked out the inner wire, so they've worked out the wire of the star shape, but they then haven't worked out the wire of the, the circle. So, again, they've not fully tried to solve this problem. Now, it could be that they're not able to work out the circumference of a circle. And notice we don't give the formula of that, they're meant to uh, know that formula. So again, it could be going back to they haven't been taught or they can't remember everything. Some of the other issues that came in back in, in at the start. And I just show you this one as an example of a learner achieving four marks here. Um, and the learner's done this very well. You can see there's a clarity of their working out on this, so that it's very, very clear, the working out. And then their answer is very clear. So it, the question again, is Calvin correct? And they put in there, yes, Calvin is correct. And then they've explained the reasons why they think that Calvin is correct. So just an example of a perfect level two, six mark question answer there. So let's look at scaffolding of questions. Learners would benefit from having questions scaffolded for them in the teaching environment. They're not necessarily going to be scaffolded in the assessment, but they do need a sort of stepping stone approach to the teaching. And what we have here is a question where Anna's going to deliver some goods. She charges £8.50 an hour and 12p per mile for delivery. She writes down her mileage before and after the journey. And we know the journey takes three hours and 30 minutes. So how much does she charge to deliver these goods? So there's a number of steps the learners need to take to, in order to answer this question. And now we could just give them this question and then they just do it. Or we can break this question down into a series of smaller questions that they can then do in the classroom. And it helps them sort of process the stages of the problem solving. So the first question we put in there is work out the cost in pounds of the mile she has traveled. We could even break that down further if we wanted. Should we, so we could say work out how far she's traveled and then work out what is the cost in pounds of the mile she's traveled. Then we've got work out the cost in pounds of the hours she has traveled and then how much does she charge to deliver these goods. So what we've done is taken a three mark question there and almost brought it down into three one mark questions. 
And this scaffolding helps the learners sort of with developing their problem solving skills. What we have here again is a level two question, and this caused real problems in the assessment for the learners. So Paul sees this ad for, for a payment plan for a laptop. The normal price was £240, pay a deposit of £36 and £15 a month for £12, use our payment plan and save 8% as the normal price. So the question is, does the payment plan save 8% as the normal price? Now, breaking down again the scaffolding, and we have the steps the learners need to take. So they work out, they need to work out the payment plan price. So that's the 15 pounds a month times by 12 plus 36. Then they need to work out what 8% of the normal price is. So what is 8% of 240 and compare the two. And then obviously just going back a quick, does the payment plan save 8% of the normal price? So we would be expecting a yes or a no there as well. Now, one technique you can have is a teacher as a calculator. It's something I've discussed before. And this technique allows the learners to focus on what the problem is and what they have to do to solve it rather than the mass. So the tutor gives the learners a problem to solve involving multiple steps. And then the teacher elicits from the learners each stage of what they have to do, carrying out the working for them. And then if a wrong suggestion is given, the teacher then can try and elicit from them why it would not work. So what you're doing there is you're actually getting the learners to focus on the problem solving rather than the actual maths itself. And I would often do this at the front of the class with one of the questions on my interactive whiteboard and eliciting from them, okay, what do I need to do first? Okay, and then getting them to sort of break it down and encouraging them towards the right first step. And if they're giving me a wrong answer, I would try and say, okay, that is something we could do, but why is it not the first thing we need to do? What do we need to do first? So let's have a look at a holistic plan for problem solving. So here is a five stage plan for problem solving in math. So first stage is to read the question carefully and then wherever possible rewrite the question in your own words and try and simplify it as much as possible what do i have to do then they can look at crossing out any unnecessary information finally underlining the important aspects of the question what is important? What information do you do? And then answer the question in stages. So let's have a look at an example of this. And we're back to the original problem solving question we had before. And here James has a contract to paint 30 identical water tanks. He has to paint the outside surfaces of each tank, but not the top. Now each surface is rectangular. James knows that one tin of paint is enough to cover 12 meters squared of surface and costs $26.99. And now you need to work out the total cost of the tins of paint he will need for 30 water tanks. So I've read the question. Secondly, in my own words, I need to work out how much paint I need to paint 30 water tanks and how much this costs. So I've simplified that into two things that I need to do. So the key phrases, outside surfaces. Now, what I can take from that, what I can deduct from that is this means surface area. What happens a lot when learners are looking at this because they're talking about water tanks, they're talking about liquid in the paint, they, uh, they often think, well, I could just fill it with paint. And that's not what the question's asking. It also says not the top, so I can skip that bit. There are 30 tanks in total. So there's gonna be at some point, something times 30. And one tin of paint covers 12 meters squared and costs 26.99. So the first thing I will do is I'll find the surface area of one tank. 
So I'll find the front and back surface area, the two sides, and then the bottom. And I work this out and I find the surface area of one tank is 3.16 meters squared. Now I need to multiply this by 30. So I have 30 tanks. So I do 30 times by 3.16 and get 94.8 meters squared. Now, again, going back to what I know, I know that one tin of paint covers 12 meters squared. So I need to work out how many tins I need. So I do 94.8 divided by 12 and I get 7.9. Now, one thing to remember, one, one little bit of my everyday life that I know is that you can't buy parts of tins of paint. Now, obviously a lot of the learners may never have bought a tin of paint, but that's the same for basically everything. Normally in, in everyday life, you can't buy parts of something. You know, I can't buy 0.5 of a car. I can't buy um, 0.5 of a can of drink, for example. So because it's 7.9, I need to round it up. Now, if it was 7.5, there's that rounding up, rounded down question. But again, the learners need to understand if they round down, even if it's 7.4 and they round down, they're not going to have enough paint. So they need eight tins. And so what we do is we work it out that 26.99 times by eight is 215 pounds and 92 pence. So we've worked out the total cost of the tins of paint that will be needed for all 30 water tanks. Now, that problem solving sort of plan there we have, is something the learners can develop it over time and something they can use probably a lot quicker than I just showed you it in an exam scenario. But it's also the same plan you would do if you were using the teacher of the calculator kind of technique as well. All right. Thank you very much for watching this video today. Um, if you are looking for more support with functional skills, then do check out the Pearson Functional Skills website.